Um, so I'm really pleased to have uh, Cole uh, Kirkby here. Cole is at the University of Sydney and he's got a really interesting research profile in um, legal history and theory um, of British colonialism uh, and how that also relates to constitutional issues in post-colonial countries. Uh, and he's done work in both of those areas. And today, um, He's combining those, those two areas in, a, in talking about uh, inventing necessity, how modern jurisprudence transformed the new third world states. Ah, that's right, Leighton Shaking said it was Matt who made that point. Um, Cole, uh, welcome to the ANU. We're sorry we can't be with you and um, give you our hospitality in person, but you're very welcome. And I think, as I said, it'd be great if you could talk somewhere between um, 20 minutes and half an hour, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. Great. Uh, yeah, so today, uh, so, so thanks again. This, this is um, really kind of like a, like a work in progress chap chapter for, for a book project, which is kind of an intellectual history of, of modern Anglo-American jurisprudence, but in the context of the Cold War and, and decolonization in particular, at, especially um, decolonization in Africa which is what I'm, what I'm kind of really, really um, interested in. And it's kind of taking the, looking at the, uh, the idea that, well, maybe I'll just read a quote. This is a, this is a quote that I really like from uh, Ernest Gellner and his kind of, you know, contemporary critique of kind of the, the Oxford um, uh, linguistic philosophers of out of whom Hart and then kind of modern jurisprudence came. And he wrote, wrote to them that, uh, Philosophers in the past were proud of changing the world and providing a guide for political life. And about the turn of the century, Oxford was a nursery for running empire. Now it's a nursery for leaving the world exactly as it is. The linguistic philosophers have their job cut out for them to rationalize the loss of English power. And this is a sociological background which is absolutely crucial to understanding the linguistic philosophers. And I would suggest it's crucial to understanding uh, heart the revival of kind of uh, and, and rise to prominence of Anglo-American, Anglo jurisprudence especially. And to understand it, we have to look at decolonization, look at what's kind of left out, uh, look left out sometimes of accounts of uh, the concept of all theorizing about law, um, as well as what, what kind of comes back in, uh, marginal questions that are taken up uh, as central jurisprudential question. So, so today is, is one chapter in that. I've, I've written about Hart elsewhere. Uh, I'm just, I just uh, published or sent, finished something on, on Finnis as well. But this is kind of looking at one of, the, one of the core kind of early debates in jurisprudence to keep problems. And this was a question of continuity and discontinuity in legal systems, right? So how do you tell when a new legal system has been created. And the, 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 the practical context of this question, the reason it rose to prominence in uh, becoming kind of a real question for, for legal philosophers in Oxford in particular, was the Rhodesian uh, Unilateral Declaration of Independence in 1965, and a series of court cases that came out of that. Um, and, and that's what, uh, that, that was kind of the central um, question, the, the theoretical kind of debate around this centered on those cases. And uh, I think one of uh, 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 Claire Pally, who was a contemporary kind of uh, writing on this, and an expert on kind of Rhodesian politics, she wrote that, uh, that those cases were manna for jurisprudence, right? So I'm sure everyone has, is, might have heard or at least familiar with these kind of cases, uh, these cases, Mazumbuko and, and other cases. But, but those were only some of a number of cases that came out of Commonwealth courts at the time. Um, and there's, there's uh, Matovo, um, Doso, which, which, which was an earlier case out of Pakistan that, that kind of established this idea of a common law doctrine of necessity as kind of the the legal answer, taking Kelsen's conceptual analysis of the creation of a new legal system and the establishment of a new grand norm and fashioning it into um, a common law doctrine. 
to decide whether a new legal system through a coup or some other takeover had been successfully established. So, so this, so, so, so that's kind of the, 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 the kind of question I'm looking at, this theoretical question, but I'm looking at it kind of starting from uh, uh, beginning in, in, in Africa and what was happening. So part of this is this chapter in this book as well is kind of a, a, a secondary kind of question running through it is um, kind of the looking at and kind of making, making visible the, the kind of the, um, the material conditions necessary for, for critique and for theory. And what happens when those conditions are, uh, don't exist or are, or are destroyed. And so um, before the 1950s, there were, with a couple uh, exceptions, and there are exceptions for particular reasons, there were no law schools in British Africa. And it wasn't a mistake. It was a deliberate policy by British officials there so that there would not be a class of African lawyers like there were in India leading um, uh, an, an independence movement or a number of independence movements. So if you were an, Af uh, uh, an African subject of the, of the British, in the British Empire, the only way, again, with a couple exceptions, uh, small exceptions, you could get a, a legal education, become a lawyer, was to come to London and sit at the end, and do your education at the ends of court. Needless to say, not many did. Not many could afford to. So the bar, the bars in in African countries were uh, African colonies were predominantly British, um, and and in the late fifties, as as kind of independence, the the possibility of independence accelerated rapidly, exponentially. There was a rush to create lawyers for these new independent states. And the leader of this movement for African education was uh, none other than Lord Denning, right? So uh, everyone would be familiar with Lord Denning if, if only from our undergraduate degrees and in, in, in torts and whatnot, but he was, he had traveled uh, throughout a number of African colonies as well as South Africa um, uh, in the 1950s and was kind of the leading British figure pushing for the establishment of legal education, a particular form of legal education, British legal education. And the way he framed it was as, um, he framed it explicitly in Christian uh, civilizational terms. Uh, he framed it as, as new, uh, this new missionary work to create, not just create lawyers, but to create lawyers of a certain, uh, with a certain ethos a certain common law and Christian ethos. And he talked about this at the, the, at the um, uh, Christian Lawyers Association in, in Britain and, and elsewhere where he was a member and a leading, leading figure. So that's kind of the, the story of the rapid creation of these law schools in a number of countries. And, and today I'm just gonna focus on uh, uh, Ghana, Uganda and, and Tanzania, which is already a lot. So I'll just say something very brief about that. So, so there was this new, by the, by the mid 1960s, there's a new class of uh, this, these new law schools and they were staffed by a mix of people. So they were staffed by, um, by, by, uh, um, by, by practicing British lawyers, right? Expatriates in, in these countries, there were, uh, in, in Ghana, especially, but also in Dar es Salaam, in, in Tanzania, there were Americans. So uh, through uh, foreign aid initiatives, Ford Foundation, there were um, uh, American law lawyers and law academics, predominantly, almost exclusively from from Yale, uh, seconded to these universities, um, and and it was also at the time seen as in British universities as a as a great career move to move here for your first law post. So uh, a number of Hearts, uh, HLA Hearts students uh, went abroad to, 
to, to these law schools. Um, William Twining, Twining is one of them. Um, there are others as well. Uh, John Finnis, he went uh, to Malawi, but that was much later in the late, late 70s. Um, anyways, there's a number of other young, young kind of academics from mostly Oxford, but also from other British universities. And there was also a number of, of local um, academics who had gone, usually gone to uh, the UK, sometimes elsewhere for their education. And so one figure like that would be Yashgai at, at Dar es Salaam. And, and they started to write their own, um, create their own law journals. Um, and, and write on kind of contemporary constitutional and, and other legal issues. Now, the, now when, when, so when these coups began to happen, um, kind of expressions really of the, of the contradictions that were kind of bottled up in the colonial era, um, they were obviously of great practical importance on the ground, but they're also bound up with um, questions about how to theorize about the nature of law, uh, not generally, but in the post-colony. So, uh, so kind of, I guess one of the, to, to, and to show you, maybe just give you a sense of, of what was at stake here. Um, there was uh, the, kind of the, the, the main, the, the most prominent and the spiciest maybe, uh, you know, magazine, African magazine at the time was, uh, transition, right? And it was edited um, uh, and published in Kampala, but it had, it was Pan-Africanist in outlook. It was uh, uh, a, a vibrant and, you know, everyone who was anyone was publishing in this magazine. And after the, the 1966 coup in, in Uganda, there was kind of a series of, of, uh, um, there was immediate crackdown, but sh but afterwards there was there was still the the, the magazine kept publishing, and uh, some of the dissenters against the coup and against a, a Bote's kind of concentration of power in in the office of the president, there was a series of of critical articles, and then in 1967 there was an ex exchange that kind of that kind of uh, set everything off. And that was uh, an article by Pico Ali, who was uh, Ugandan, but trained as a lawyer in the USSR, came back very close to the president. And he gave, in his article, an extended kind of account of what is the nature of law and what is the purpose of law in, uh, in a new African state. And for him, it was law is subjective, sub subjected to and, and is uh, a servant to the development needs of the state. The law has to uh, advance the state's development um, at, at, as is not only its primary purpose, but its only purpose, right? There's no other, um, law had no kind of autonomous function. It was subservient to the state and the state's ends and pursuing those ends. In the next issue, there were five letters to the editor that were published anyways, uh, each increasingly critical of uh, Pico Ali and his article. And the last one was the one that was uh, the most critical. And it was critical in, in two ways. One was that it it hinted at the fact that, um, uh, uh, sorry, and, and the Pico Ali's article also said that a, a problem, one problem they had to deal with was to Africanize the courts because the courts were dominated by uh, white expat Brits or, or foreign judges from other countries in Africa. So I had to make it Ugandans, particularly um, uh, black Ugandans in that context. And so the, the next article, this, this one, by um, Abu Bakr Kaki um, um, Mayanda, what he was, he argued, well, Abote as president with all his powers could Africa, Africanize the courts tomorrow. Why hasn't he done that? And it also, he also raised the, the issue of, the, of uh, the fact that 
if if we want to make this you know if we want to make african or sorry the the uh the law subservient to the state and its development needs and we want to africanize not just the courts but the law itself then why is the abote government relying on colonial era laws of to repress um, people who are trying to pursue their vision of, of what the state should be, uh, namely the emergency, emergency laws and laws of arbitrary detention. So uh, as you can imagine, shortly thereafter, uh, the editor of Transition and Mayanja were picked up, put in jail under these arbitrary detention laws. Uh, short, short story kind of aftermath of this is that uh, transition is shut down, um, opposition, uh, uh, suppression of opposition, political opposition continues um, and, and, and deepens. Uh, 1971, it kind of, it, it culminates in a second coup, this time against Abote by his military chief, who everyone probably has heard of before, Idi Amin Dada, and, and, and that's kind of a, 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 a enters in a new stage, uh, not just in Uganda, but elsewhere in Africa, of kind of a, uh, uh, as these kind of contradictions are resolved in different ways. Now, as this was going on, there's also these new law schools. And there's, and there's the, so the questions of the legal, and, and there's court cases about the legality of these, these coups um, at the time. So, and these, these, these debates happen in, in two kind of overlapping uh, uh, networks of publications. So the first are these new African law journals from these uh, new law schools written by local academics. And then there is um, uh, another set centered on um, uh, centered on the UK, and in particular, the annual survey of Commonwealth law. So this was created in the, uh, I think, 1966. Again, the prime mover here was Lord Denning, but also academics uh, in Oxford. And it was kind of, it was, it was the, it was, it was an annual survey, a critical survey and discussion of Commonwealth uh, jurisprudence across the former British Empire. And Denning kind of continuing his missionary um, kind of vision uh, 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 for, for Africa and the British Empire saw, saw this as creating, he wanted it to be a single common law to unite the Commonwealth. And the Commonwealth in his vision and in those who founded it wasn't just uh, an, a, a talk shop for, for these for these former colonies and the mother country. It was to be uh, some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, global polity, if not, if not quite, if not an empire exactly, or, or anything like it used to be, then some kind of uh, um, transnational body to rival the two superpowers, um, the United States, the USSR, uh, as well as the the new um, European community, right? So this was part of a bigger kind of vis political vision, and so this was the and this 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 new annual survey was also a prestige publication, so it was it was seen as the place to publish for your academic career. So it had that kind of uh, importance as well. So in that so in this annual survey as well as in the usual kind of journals, that modern law review and so on is where these, this kind of secondary um, discourse was happening. And they were, they were overlapping, so they were, they were citing each other as well. Um, right, so, and this is where the, the kind of, the theorizing about these practical cases took place. So I won't, I won't go into too much of, of the detail about, about this. Um, about the actual kind of substantive um, uh, analyses of the continuity and discontinuity of law in cases of coup. 
coups, I just want to give, so if you're not familiar with that, I'll just kind of give you like a, 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 a sh short, short version. So, so the common law doctrine of necessity, again, relied on Kelsen's conceptual analysis of when a new legal system was created, right? The, the, when, when a new uh, ground norm, basic norm was assumed and common law judges in, in a number of these cases kind of all citing each other back to, originally back to that, that Pakistan case, uh, Doso in the 1950s, um, turn that conceptual analysis into a practical common law test, a doctrine. And it was taken up and used in different ways by these courts in uh, Uganda, um, uh, Ghana later on, Nigeria, Rhodesia, and then in later years, it, elsewhere in, in, the, in the Commonwealth. But the, the, the theoretical question was, uh, you know, kind of related to that, like, how should we understand, uh, how should we conceptualize coups and, and the creation of whether there's a new legal system or not and, and kind of the, the problems around that. And for the dominant, dominant kind of legal positivist answer and, and the, the kind of corollary to that is what should judges do? So the legal positivist kind of answer was, was really at least in kind of uh, Hart's formulation and kind of as it was followed by those who followed his kind of approach was that it was really um, uh, uh, an empirical question, right? Did most people follow the rules of the new order? And if so, then there was a new uh, basic norm or a new uh, rule of recognition. If not, then the old system, the old, the old legal system continued to persist. The, the, the main kind of rival explanation of this, and, and this, this kind of debate culminated in 1973 in the Oxford Handbook of Jurisprudence, second volume, um, where it all kind of all came to a head and then kind of more or less abruptly stopped, which the reason, I'll just kind of just say quickly in passing, is that Britain joined the EU and the Commonwealth didn't really matter anymore. That's kind of what effectively ended that, this debate. And it's, it's kind of like institutional importance. But the rival answer for Finnis was that there, this is again a short, short version, is that there was, um, we can understand coups as changing, uh, as, as we, we can kind of like, we can take the rule of recognition and break it up into components. And we can say that, well, some coups are just about changing they're not about changing a rule of recognition, they're just changing about who gets to decide certain, certain issues, who gets to appoint themselves in certain positions of authority. But what, what really matters is, is, that, is that there's actually continuity across any change of authority, um, any, um, any, any illegal constitutional change. And the continuity is because um, there's always a community that persists through time and persists through any, through any kind of constitutional rupture. And that's ultimately what matters. And in these hard cases, these coup cases, what judges have to do is there's no real kind of legal answer for them. They just have to be guided by the practical considerations of wise men uh, uh, pursuing kind of um, what wise men thinking of what is guided by the common good of that underlying community, and that's how they should act and respond in in coup cases. And, and the kind of the the, the the effect of his reasoning is that um, is that is that uh, judges really don't have much choice, but if, if, if a coup is effective, so you kind of follow the positive and say, if a coup is effective, then, then judges can, can recognize that, can acknowledge that, but there's limits. And the limits are when a coup attempts to radically transform the society itself. 
if the coup leaders, if a new revolutionary government tries to change society, tries to change, transform the, the community, this underlying community, tries to um, uh, effectively attack its common good, then, you're, then, then you have to resist as best you can. And, and in practice, what that meant in, in Africa at the time is any kind of government that was pursuing a radical socialist agenda in, in Finnis's reading anyways. And then the final thing I want to say today is that, law, so that those kind of two analyses, uh, if, if you're familiar with this, you'll be familiar with those, I think, two different analyses. Um, but there's a third one that's, that's lost to us now, a third way of thinking about this. Uh, and the reason it was lost was because the consequence of these coups was first the repression and then the, 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 the killing or jailing or forcing into exile of, of critical academics, uh, lawyers in these new African universities. Um, if you take the case of Dar es Salaam, you had uh, where, where in Tanzania, which even there had, had relatively little repression compared to elsewhere, even there from the late 60s to the early 70s, there was uh, the, those who offered this kind of different analysis all were pushed or, or fled. So um, Yash Gai, uh, Mahmoud Mamdani, uh, Walter Rodney, all left for different or pushed for different reasons. Uh, one one did say uh, it's a shifty shifty, um, right? And and so so their analysis was different. It began not uh, not by um, it, it began in the post colony. It began with asking what is the political economy of the post-colony. What is the nature of this new state, right? It didn't be, so it began from a very different place then, and, and, and uh, then legal positivists asked different questions. And unlike Finnis, it didn't, uh, it didn't, um, didn't assume, didn't assume there was a coherent community with a single common good, right? Because the very nature of the post-colony, when you begin in a post-colony and ask its nature, was that it was structured uh, through the segreg through segregation of different racial community, whites, Asiatics, Africans, and kind of the contemporary terminology of the British. And then for, for the African subjects into different tribes. And if, if you begin in this place, if you begin from this kind of a, um, a, a approach, your, your analysis of, of coups and what coups are about and how to deal with them uh, is 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 quite different, um, and what judges should do in these cases, and how and how you analyze them, is it, is even when you talk about it at the, at a level of theory, focuses more. It, it widens the lens beyond outside the courtroom, outside the role of judges, to the place of judges within these new states, their roles and responsibilities, the limits of their power and also other people's and movements, responsibilities and relationship to those judges. But I, I see I'm, I'm probably getting close to my time, so I might just stop there. And, uh, and, and thanks everyone for, for listening, listening to me for the uh, uh, last half hour. Thanks. I will um, thank Carl for a really fascinating, really, really fascinating um, seminar and a great discussion. Thank you for everybody for turning up. Um, and uh, thank you for Ash for, for working behind the scenes to, to make all of this happen. Um, we'll be having another seminar in this series, either live or, um, well, live either in, in person or via Zoom uh, next month. So stay tuned for those announcements. But thanks, everybody. <laughs>